All right, so as you can see, we've recently begun a series in the book of Mark entitled The Glorious Unfolding. All right, and in the book of Mark, we are going to see Jesus introduced to us in a lot of different ways as a miracle worker, as a savior, as a son of God, and most importantly, as the servant who came to give his life as a ransom for our sins. And so we've been in the series now for a few weeks. In week number one, we got all the way through verse number one, right? And we talked about the introduction to the book, who wrote it, why it was written, uh, kind of the big overall theme of the book. And then last week, we looked at verses two through eight, which introduced us to an interesting character by the name of John the Baptist, this man who wore camel's hair, who ate locusts and honey, a man who people just flocked to in the wilderness, and his mission was to prepare the way for Jesus. Quite a responsibility, wasn't it? And so we looked at John's life and some of the takeaways that we could take from our, and apply to our lives. But today we're going to get into really what the entire book is about, and that is Jesus and his ministry on earth. And so today we're going to begin looking at the early events of Jesus' earthly ministry in a message that I've simply entitled, The Great Association. And that's going to make sense to you here in just a minute. But we will see how the events covered in verses 9 through 15 that Chris just read bring us hope, help, and healing to our lives as we choose to follow Jesus. All right, so let me pray. Let me uh, begin that way, and then we will dive into our passage today and just kind of unpack what we see here in both the baptism and the temptation of Jesus, and then as he begins his earthly ministry. So, Father, I pray now that as your word is open before us, God, that you will help us to have ears to hear what is being said, hearts that are open to receive what you want us to receive, and may we leave here changed and transformed because your spirit did a work through your word in our hearts. Lord, really, this is the most important part of our Sunday morning, where your word is open and where, Father God, we are giving you permission just to speak to our hearts. So God, I pray that you will do what only you can do this morning. And it's in Jesus' powerful name I pray. Amen. One of the beauties of human life is the potential that exists with each new day, right? Every day you wake up and it seems like you never know exactly what that day is going to be like, right? You don't know if it's going to be a good day, if it's going to be a bad day. You don't know exactly what circumstances are going to arise during the day. Some days are filled with great joy, while others end up being difficult, rather depressing days. Is, you guys relate to that, or is it just me? You guys have some days that are good, some days that are bad, right? It seems like life is a never-ending roller coaster. Some days are up, some days are down. And when your feet hit the floor in the morning, you don't know exactly what that day is going to be like. You have no idea how this person's going to treat you or what circumstances are going to happen. You have a plan for your day most of the time. You have an idea of what you're going to do, but you have no idea exactly what that day is going to bring. You can have a fabulous day one moment and the next day have a no good, terrible, very bad day, right? And so you never know exactly what is in store. Not only that, some days can be good and bad all in the same day. Anybody ever experienced that? You can have a great day, and then all of a sudden something happens, and your day just turns bad. When I was thinking about kind of a way to introduce this and and give you a kind of example from my life, I thought about something that happened in the summer of my, leading into my junior year of college, right? Most of you know, if you know Jen and I, you know that she is from Connecticut. I am from Ohio. We met in college. And so while the school year was going on, we got to see each other. But in the summers, she went her way. I went mine. We kind of did our own thing. And every summer, usually she would come visit me once and I'd go visit her. Well, it was about time for school to start and she had come to visit me. And so it was always fun when she would come and visit, get to hang out with my friends and my family and things like that. But on this particular day, we were going to go up to Lake Erie. My grandfather had a boat, and we were going to do some water skiing. I loved to water ski, and so it was something she, I don't think, had ever really done before. So I was looking forward to getting to watch her <laughs> learn to water ski or attempt to water ski and get to show off, right, as her boyfriend, because I've done it before. And so get to go water skiing. And so we go up to Lake Erie, and we're out on the boat. It's my grandfather who's driving the boat. My mom is there, and, and then Jen and myself. And, and so we're just enjoying the day out on Lake Erie water skiing skiing and, you know, being the, the, the good boyfriend that I was, uh, decided it was time to show off a little bit, right? It was getting kind of boring just skiing on two skis. All right, so we have this great day. It's been a fabulous day so far. Everything is awesome. You know, I'm out on the boat with my grandfather, with my girlfriend, with my mom. Everything is good. It's a beautiful day, kind of a last hurrah before we had to head back to school. And so I'm out there skiing, and then I'm like, you know what? I'm going to try slalom skiing which means one ski if you're not familiar with water skiing, right? And so 
I've never really been taught exactly how to do it. I, I had attempted to ski on one ski before, but I could never actually fully get up on the water and, and, and ski on one ski. So I'm like, you know what? I'm going to do it, but I'm going to have to take my other ski off. And so I'm out there. I'm on the water. I'm skiing. I'm holding on, you know, going in and out of the wake, all this kind of stuff. And then I decide, you know what? I'm just going to take the ski off. Now, nobody told me that I should kick my ski off and go back and get it. But if you ever water ski and you decide to take a ski off, word to the wise, kick it off. Okay? Leave it behind. Don't do what I did. What did I do? I reached down. I grabbed it. So I have it under my arm. I'm holding on with a ski under my arm. And then I crash. And guess what happens to the ski? The point of the ski goes right here, right into my forehead. And I hit the water. I come up. I put my hand here, and it's covered with blood. And we're out in the middle of Lake Erie. And so I'm freaking out a little bit. I think I'm in shock. The boat circles around. I think somehow I did find the ski. But the boat circles around. And my mom, being a nurse, automatically realizes what has happened, because blood is just gushing out. Now, I think my mom was in shock, because as a nurse, she probably did something she shouldn't do. She took a towel, put it in the dirty, disgusting Lake Erie water, and put it right on my forehead to try to stop the bleeding. I guess you're supposed to stop the bleeding, but I don't know if you should have put it in that disgusting water. So this great day has all of a sudden turned bad into most, one of the worst days of my life. We have to get back to shore, then we have to get to the car, then we have to drive to the hospital. A little while later, they life flight me from that hospital to another hospital closer to my house, and I lay there in a hospital bed not knowing exactly what's going to happen in the next 12 to 24 hours. This great day has all of a sudden turned into one of the worst days of my life. Never been in the hospital really up to this point. And now I'm here all of a sudden not knowing what they're going to have to do because my skull is fractured, not sure exactly what's going to happen in the moments to come. A good day that turned into a terrible day. Right? And so it's one of those things that you guys were into that story. It ended up God worked amazing. I'm here, right? I survived. Everything went okay. All right? I, I was in the hospital. I was out the next day. Everything worked good because God worked miraculously in that situation. Praise God. But as I was saying, it can be a good day, and all of a sudden it can turn bad. What we see here in Mark chapter 1 is kind of similar. You have this amazing event take place where Jesus is baptized. The Holy Spirit comes down, fills them. The Father speaks. And then the very next moment... Immediately, we find Jesus in the wilderness for 40 days being tempted by the devil. And it's like it changes so quickly. One minute, he's on a spiritual high. The next moment, he's in a spiritual battle like he's never faced before. And so that's what we want to look at today here in this passage in Mark chapter 1, verses 9 through 15. Because what we see Jesus experience... Not only in the highs and lows of life is something we experience on a regular basis, but I think what we see Jesus go through here is going to help us as we navigate through our daily lives. And so as we dive into this passage, I want you to notice how Jesus in this passage identifies with us through these various events that are going to take place in Mark 1 verses 9 through 15. Now, as we go on in the book of Mark, we're going to see Jesus do all sorts of different miracles, right? We're going to see him do heal and, and do all these things that uh, Jesus as a son of God can do. But what I love about our first introduction to Jesus here in the book of Mark is that we see Jesus identifying with you and I as human beings in the events that take place here in this passage. So first of all, I want you to see that Jesus' baptism offers you and I hope. As we read the account here of his baptism, it, it offers you and I hope as we navigate through the daily situations of life. Look again at verse number 9. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven saying, you are my beloved son, with you I am well pleased. And kind of an aside here before I dive into how we see Jesus just identifying with us in this passage, is here we see very clearly the trinity 
all coming together as one, don't we? We see in these verses the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit all at work in this one particular event. Jesus, the Son, is being baptized. The Holy Spirit is coming in to empower him for ministry. And we see God speaking audibly from the heavens saying, This is my beloved Son, in him I am well pleased. So if you ever find people who question the Trinity, this is a great place to take them because we see all three elements, all three persons of the Trinity uh, active in what is taking place here in the baptism of Jesus. And so as you read the account of Jesus getting baptized, it's easily to initially question why Jesus is even getting baptized in the first place. In fact, John in one of the other Gospels says, who am I to baptize you? Why are you coming to me? I should be coming to you to be baptized because John understands who Jesus is. And so we can read this passage, and if we have an understanding of baptism, it's almost like, okay, why is Jesus being baptized here? Right, because we know if we've grown up in church, the the significance of baptism in our lives, right? We just had a baptism service a couple weeks ago. And in that baptism service, what we are doing is we are kind of allowing people to identify with Jesus. People who are recognizing, I'm a sinner, I, I need Jesus, and I am publicly now declaring that I have chosen to follow him, right? That is what baptism is all about. But yet we look at the life of Jesus and we know that he is perfect, So why in the world does Jesus have any need to be baptized? Because we know it's not because of any sin that he has committed. So why is it that Jesus is being baptized? Well, Jesus was baptized, it says, in order to fulfill all righteousness. Look at what it says in Matthew chapter 3. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to John to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him saying, I need to be baptized by you and do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, let it be so now, for thus it is fitting for all of us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he consented. And so we see here, Jesus is coming to be baptized because it says to fulfill all righteousness. While John's baptism was one of repentance, Jesus had nothing to repent for. But yet he says, no, John, you need to baptize me because I am doing this to fulfill all righteousness. In other words, what he's saying is, I am doing this to identify myself with the people who I came to redeem. So it's a way that Jesus is identifying with us. He is being baptized as a way of identifying with us. Not because he has sin in his life, like why we get baptized, but because he is identifying with us, the people he has come to. To redeem. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says this, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So Jesus is identifying with us so that he can be our righteousness. Because one day you're going to stand before God, and it's not going to be because of any righteous deeds that you have done. It's going to be because Jesus and his righteousness is how the Father sees you. If you are a child of God, it is the righteousness of Jesus that covers you. And when God looks at your life, he sees you as a follower of God through the righteousness of Jesus being imputed to you. And so when Jesus is being baptized, it's not because there's any sin, but he's being baptized because he's trying to fulfill all matter of righteousness. He's trying to identify with us, letting us know that he is the one who's going to allow us to be righteous before God. God. So in order for Jesus to be the propitiation for our sin or the satisfying agent for our sin, he had to become completely human. And in his baptism, he is identifying with our humanity. Does that make sense? Because in order to forgive us of our sins and die in our place, he had to become a man. And so in his baptism, he is identifying with us. And because of that, When we look at his baptism, it should give us hope because one day I can stand before God knowing that I have the righteousness of Jesus by which God sees me through. I love this quote by David Guzik. He said this, Jesus didn't have to be baptized. He also didn't have to die on a cross in our place. He did both things to express his solidarity with fallen man. And so when he was baptized to fulfill all righteousness, he was identifying himself with us as the one who would one day redeem us from 
our sin. So in the baptism of Jesus, we see a great picture of just the Trinity on display, but we see, more importantly, the hope that Jesus brings and the fact that he identifies with us and our humanity, and without him becoming a man, we would have no hope of being forgiven. Does that make sense? And so we see that Jesus' baptism offers us hope. One day when you stand before God, it's not going to be about your righteous deeds, right? The Bible says all those are like filthy rags. And if you are sitting here saying that my hope is in how good of a person I've been, then you are putting your hope in the wrong place. Because your, the Bible says all your righteous deeds are like filthy rags before God. It doesn't matter how many elderly ladies you've helped across the street, how much money you've given to the poor, how many times you've fed those in need. None of that matters if your hope is not in Jesus. If your hope is solely in what you have done, one day you're going to be sorely mistaken and you're going to realize, man, I put all my eggs in the wrong basket when all this time I was focusing on what I could do and all the good things I could do when really it was about Jesus and his righteousness being imputed to me. So there's great hope that we see in the baptism of Jesus because it is there that he identifies with us, fallen man, and the need we have for a Savior. So there's hope in the baptism of Jesus. So we have this great spiritual high, right? This moment where Jesus is baptized by John, the Holy Spirit descends on him like a dove, empowering him for the ministry that is about to take place. God speaking from heaven, hey, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And then notice what it says next. The Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. Now, this is kind of with Mark's writing style. Remember, if you were here a couple weeks ago, we talked about the writing style of Mark. He's going to use this word immediately a bunch of times in the Gospel of Mark. All right? And it's like he is just kind of giving us all the facts. This happens, and then immediately this happens, and the next this happens, and then this happens. Like, it is going to be just like, that's why we've only made it through like 15 verses in three weeks. Because there's all these things just happening so quickly. We're not getting tons of details But we're just seeing Mark record all these amazing things. And so it says the Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. And he was in the wilderness 40 days being tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild animals and the angels were ministering to him. So in the same way that Jesus' baptism offers us hope, the second thing I want us to see in this passage is that Jesus' temptation offers us help. Have you ever faced tempting times in your life? Okay, have you ever faced times when you've been tested or tried in your life? Difficult situations? Well, this passage where we see Jesus tempted can offer us great help as we navigate through those various temptations and trials in our lives. So after this spiritual high of baptism, we see that Jesus is immediately ushered into the wilderness. A time that was intended to be set aside for prayer and fasting and fellowship with the Father in lieu of the ministry that he was about to undertake has now become a period of intense temptation and testing. Now, I think one of the common misunderstandings we have when we read this, uh, this passage is we think that, you know, Satan just kind of came with these three temptations and that was it. But I think as you study this, you find that it was during that 40-year period, like Satan was just in all-out attack mode. Now, we get an example of three of the temptations here, but this was a period where while Jesus is trying to just draw close to the Father in a time of prayer and fasting, that Satan is just bombarding him with all these temptations. And the worse it becomes, the hungrier he gets, right? I mean, how would you feel after 40 days of not eating? Like, you would be on edge probably, and yet that is when Satan's continuing to attack Jesus. And we see, again, it's after this great moment of victory at the baptism that all of a sudden he's ushered into the wilderness. And how often do we see the enemy's strongest attacks directly on our lives after we've experienced moments of significant spiritual breakthrough? Sometimes the periods of hardest temptation are the moments after we've experienced some sort of great spiritual victory. Have you seen that to be true? I know I've seen that to be true in my life. It's like, Satan knows 
that that bullseye needs to be big on your back because you're going to continue to ride on the spiritual high you've experienced. And so he's going to do everything he can to try to bring you down and kind of dampen your spirits after you've seen God move and work in a mighty way. Right? And so when you experience some great spiritual victory, be ready because that's usually when the temptation comes the hardest. And as much as we would love to say on the, stay on the mountain type all the time, it is in the battle that we experience the greatest amount of growth. And so we're going to see that here. Jesus goes from the mountaintop to the valley, and Satan's going to come after him. But I know I've noticed in my life that it's those times in the valley, it's those difficult times in life where I've seen the greatest growth, right? I'd love to be on the mountaintop all the time. I'd love to say that I could just stay on the mountaintop. But that's not reality. We have to get into the valley because that's where God does his greatest work. And so while God was trying to use this period of Jesus' life as a way of preparing him and growing him, we see that Satan in those same circumstances is trying to tempt Jesus to draw him away from God. I love what Bill Foote says. He says this, God uses circumstances to test us in order to develop us. Well, Satan uses these same circumstances to tempt us in order to destroy us. So the same circumstances that God is trying to use for good, the enemy is trying to use for bad. And so that's what's happening here in the wilderness. And all of us are going to experience temptation. The question is, how will we respond when the temptation comes our way? And the fact that Jesus experienced temptation means that he can help us through whatever we may be experiencing, right? The fact that Jesus faced this gives us great comfort because we can find help in our time of need. We can find help when we are in the middle of a battle. And we can look right to Jesus and how he handled these temptations as a man. He can help us, not as somebody who has observed it happening, but he can help us as somebody who has experienced it in ways we've never even experienced. And so he can relate to us in our temptation because he too has been tempted. The fact that he's experienced temptation means that he can help us through whatever we may be facing. I love what it says in Hebrews chapter 2. Therefore he had to be made like his brothers in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. Going on in Hebrews chapter 4, for we do not have a high priest, this is speaking of Jesus, and I love this, who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Man, if you get nothing else today, take a picture of that verse, write that verse down, memorize that verse, meditate on that all week long, because we do not have a high priest that's unable to sympathize with us. Anything you go through in life, any temptation, any trial, any difficulty, you can cling to Jesus because he's been there, he's got the t-shirt, he's had victory, and he can help you through whatever the situation is that you're facing. Because we don't have a high priest who can't sympathize with us, who's just kind of observed passively. No, we have a high priest who has been in the fire in the midst of temptation and has come out victorious. And so he can be the help we need in the midst of the temptations and the trials that we face. And so as we come to these verses about Jesus' time in the wilderness, it's important that we understand some basic principles regarding temptation, right? Because, you know, as believers, as followers of Jesus, we are going to face temptation. We're going to face trials, right? God is never going to tempt us to do evil, but the enemy is going to tempt us. There are times that we're going to be put in situations God's testing our faith and trying our faith, but those same circumstances, the enemy might be trying to tempt us to do evil, so what are some of these principles we need to understand? And they won't be on the screen, but maybe you'll write them down. The first thing I want us to understand is the sources of temptation. Now here we see that Jesus is facing direct attacks from Satan himself. However, please understand this is not necessarily the case for us in every temptation that we experience. Right? Every time you experience temptation does not mean that Satan is attacking you. 
Because Satan is not omnipresent, right? Satan cannot be everywhere all at one time. So if you're facing temptation, don't automatically assume, well, this is Satan attacking me because there could be other sources of the temptation. For instance, the Bible talks about three primary sources where temptation can come. The world that we live in, the flesh that we indwell, and then Satan. And more often than not, it's probably one of the first two as opposed to the latter one. So before you sit here and say, well, this demon in my life, and it might be, but it might just be your sinful flesh that you're having to battle in that moment. It might just be the world and the corrupt world in which we live that you are having to battle. So although Satan and his demons can directly attack us, our primary battle is with the world and with the flesh. James 1 verse 13 says this, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. In other words, he's not going to solicit any of us to do evil. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Romans 7, verse 18, Paul writes, for I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. All right, so there he's talking about the flesh, right? Nothing good dwells in our flesh because by nature we have a bent towards sin. And I use this illustration all the time, but I think it's perfect. That's why I have to train my children to do right and not train them to do wrong. They naturally will do wrong if I do not steer them in the right direction. Because that is our nature. So Paul says, For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. Ever been there? Man, I want to do this, and I know it's the right thing, but I find myself doing this. Well, you're in good company, because Paul struggled with the same thing. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do, want, do not want is what I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. Now, that's a tongue twister to read, but I think you get the point. That which Paul says, I want to do, I find myself not doing. That which I don't want to do, I find myself doing. Why? Because there's a sin nature, a natural bent towards evil that all of us are hardwired towards. And so we need to understand, when we face temptation... Don't just blame it on the devil all the time, although he's evil and wants to bring you down. You have a sinful flesh that you have to deal with every moment of every day, and you have a world that is not uh, you know, kind towards seeking after God, and you're living in that. And so there's lots of sources for temptation in our lives. But no matter how hard we try, we're not going to eliminate temptation. Right? You find this sometimes, you know, nuns or monks or whatever think oh, I'm going to go get, live in a convent somewhere or a monastery and I'm going to isolate myself from the world and there will be no temptation. The problem is you can eliminate the worldly influences, but what do you still have when you're there? You still have the sinful flesh. And so we need to understand we're never going to eliminate temptation in our lives. So then that means we have to learn how do we fight it? How do we resist it? How do we battle it? if it's something I cannot eliminate from my lives. And if Jesus couldn't eliminate the temptation, then certainly we will not be able to either. So the source of temptation, the world, the flesh, the devil, all of those are at war against you and your desire to do right. So what's the nature of temptation? The nature of temptation. We looked at the sources. Now, what's the nature of temptation? Romans 10 says this, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now, temptation typically manifests itself in one of three ways, which is what we see here in the wilderness. Understand, those who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. There's help in Jesus, no matter what you're facing. But as we see temptation here in the wilderness, we see that it manifests itself in one of three ways. First John chapter 2, look at what it says. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, notice this next statement, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. So in those verses, we see the nature of temptation. The desires of the flesh 
the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life. That is the nature of the temptation that we face in our lives. So let's look at those real briefly this morning. The lust of the flesh, or the desires of the flesh. What is that talking about? Well, the lust of the flesh speaks of our natural propensity to sin. And again, I've mentioned we all have this natural bent towards evil. Now, to get a picture of exactly what the temptation is here that Jesus is facing, you have to go to some of the other Gospels. Because again, I mentioned that Mark, he's not going into a lot of detail. He's just saying kind of, you know, newspaper version, hey, this is what happened. And then he's moving on to the next story. But Matthew is going to break down a little bit more for us the temptation that Jesus faced. So what are some of the temptations that he faced when it comes to the desires of the flesh? Notice what it says in Matthew 4. And the tempter came, same story, just a little more detail in Matthew, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. All right? That's the essence of that temptation. So after 40 days, you'd be pretty hungry safe to say, right? Now, could Jesus have turned those stones into loaves of bread? Absolutely, he could have. Satan knew he had the power to do it, but Jesus also knew that that was not his time or his place in which to do that. So there was, he's attacking him here with the lust of the flesh. He says, turn these stones to bread. Jesus would have been extremely hungry. He could have easily done it. But the temptation here was to doubt the provision of God and trust in self. There was a legitimate need, but Satan wanted him to meet that need in an illegitimate way. And how often do we face temptations where maybe there's a need, but our temptation is to meet it in an illegitimate way? You see, God creates within us natural God-given desires, right? One of the desires is the desire for food and hunger. And we can meet that in illegitimate ways if we eat too much and become gluttonous and those kind of things, right? There's desire that God places in us sexually. And we can meet those in illegitimate ways. And we see that happening all over in our culture, don't we? It's not always easy to do things God's way. And that was the temptation here. Hey, Jesus, turn stones to bread. But Jesus knew that although there is a need and I'm hungry and I could do it, I'm not going to meet it in this illegitimate way. So we are often tempted to satisfy these natural desires outside of the boundaries that God gives us. Does that make sense? And that's kind of this idea of the lust of the flesh. But then 1 John goes on, as we saw, to talk about the pride of life. Now, the pride of life is a desire in every human being to be his or her own God. Ever been in that place where you just want to control things yourself? Where you want to call the shots? Where you want to make all decisions? Where you want to just rely on yourself and your intuition and your knowledge and not really consider what it is that God has in store? Well, that's the idea here of the pride of life. Arrogance, self-promotion, greed, all of those things stem from the pride of life. And in Jesus' temptation, he faced the same thing. Matthew 4, verse 5 through 7. Then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against the stone. And Jesus said to him, again it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. So Satan tried to get Jesus to prove before all of Jerusalem that he was indeed the Messiah. Because Satan says, hey, after all, the angels will protect you. If you're truly the Messiah, just jump down off the temple. Prove to everybody that you are the Messiah. But yeah, what does Jesus do? He says, no. We are not to tempt the Lord our God. 
So here, he is tempting him with the pride of life, trying to get him to overstep the boundaries that God has given, trying to get him to you know, promote himself in a way that God did not attend. And how often in our lives do we too try to control our own lives? How often are we tempted to just do our own thing with the mindset that, well, God will work it all out in the end, so I'm just going to do whatever I want to do and then just hope that God will kind of fix it all when it's all said and done. Ever been there? Ever face those temptations where I'm going to do this and then just let God fix it on the, on the backside? That's this temptation, the pride of life, to be your own God, to set yourself up as the authority instead of allowing yourself to rest in the providence of God. So we see the lust of the flesh, the pride of life, and the third one it mentioned there in John was the lust of the eyes. This occurs when we see things that we want and then allow ourselves to lust or covet after those particular things. Matthew chapter 4, continuing on in the temptation of Jesus, says this, Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. So what was the temptation here? Well, Satan showed Jesus the kingdoms of the world and said that they could all be his if he would simply bow down and worship Satan. At the heart of this temptation is a lack of trust in God's plan. Instead of trusting God to work and give us what we need, we take matters into our own hands. And we allow ourselves to see things that we want and we chase after them and covet them instead of relying on God's plan. It just so happened in my devotions this week to be in 2 Samuel. In 2 Samuel, you see the story of David and Bathsheba, right? You see David, if you don't know the story, he's a king. He's supposed to be out at battle, but instead of being out at battle, he sends his army and he kind of stays home. And, you know, he's got all this idle time, and he goes up onto his rooftop, and as he's on his rooftop, he observes, and he sees Bathsheba, this beautiful lady who is bathing. And then what happens? The lust of the eyes sets in. He sees something he wants, and then he goes after it, and it becomes a mess. He ends up killing her husband, and this whole, like, soap opera of things happen, all because he gave in to the lust of the eyes. He saw something he wanted, and he went after it, instead of resting and relying on the plan of God. And can I remind us that sometimes it's that idle time that gets us in the most trouble? As it says, the idle time is the devil's workshop, so be careful with idle time. And I know I find in my life that some of the, most, the times I'm most prone to temptation are times when I'm idle and times when I'm tired. And those moments, if you're not careful, you are opening yourself up for temptation to be on the attack. David wasn't where he was supposed to be, and he ended up falling into the lust of the eyes. And so all these temptations were prevalent there as Jesus is having this battle with Satan. So we've seen uh, the source of temptation. We've seen the nature of temptation. But now I want us to see and understand how Jesus attacks the temptation, how he battles against it, and see the weapons we have for fighting against temptation. Notice here in verse number 12, it says this, The Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. The Spirit drove him out. So we need to understand that weapon number one, and these don't go in any particular order, but one of the weapons we have as we fight against temptation is the Holy Spirit. That's an important weapon that we need to lean into when we are facing temptation. It was the Holy Spirit that led Jesus into the wilderness. It was the Holy Spirit that was giving him strength to overcome the temptation that he was facing. And in our lives, we need to understand that if we are going to battle the temptation in our lives, we too need the power of the Holy Spirit. Because if you are battling against your sinful flesh or you are battling against the devil you are at a disadvantage. If you are relying on your own strength, your own wisdom, your own knowledge, Satan has been scheming for thousands of years at how to bring mankind down. And so if you're relying on your own strength, 
to pull you through, you are going to be defeated. So we need to rely and rest in the Holy Spirit and the strength that he gives us to help us overcome temptation. But then I want you to notice, not only do we need the Holy Spirit as a weapon, we also need a knowledge of the Word of God. I don't know if you noticed it or not, but in every one of these temptations that we are given here that Satan throws at Jesus, what does he do in response? He combats it with Scripture. As it is written, or this is what the Lord says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. As it is written, you should not tempt the Lord your God. And so he comes back at Satan with Scripture. And can I tell you, one of your greatest weapons in the middle of spiritual battle is going to be your knowledge of Scripture. If you find yourself in a place where there's some besetting sin that is constantly tearing you down and constantly getting the best of you, can I encourage you, find a verse in Scripture that helps you battle that and memorize it. If you do nothing else this week, memorize that verse because when the temptation comes, you can then quote that Scripture and you can battle the temptation because you have a weapon with which to battle it. I love what it says in Ephesians chapter 6. It's talking about the spiritual armor. Um, oh, went too far. It says, And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Do you know that in the spiritual armor it talks about in Ephesians 6, when it talks about the helmet and the belt and the shoes and all those kind of things, there is only one offensive weapon that we are given. Do you know what it is? It's the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. When you are battling against temptation, this is the weapon that you need to know how to wield. You need to know this book, know what it says, be immersed in it so that when temptation comes, you can immediately draw verses to help you battle against the temptation that you're facing. So if we are going to resist temptation, we must have an artillery of verses to use. The better we know the word, the stronger we will be when facing temptation. And so maybe for some of us today, that's the application from this message. Maybe for some of us, it's like, yikes. If the Bible is that important for me to have victory, then I need to be a little bit more consistent as to spending time in the Bible. You see, this is not a book you just dust off every Sunday morning and put under your arm and bring to church with you. Okay? This is a book that is your greatest spiritual weapon. But you need to know how to use it. Right? You need to know how to use it. And so if you aren't spending time in it and you're not getting familiar with it, you can't expect to be able to use it properly when temptation comes. And so Jesus gives us a great example here of how to fight against temptation temptation, how to battle in the spiritual battles that all of us will face. And he gives us a great example. He provides for us help as we encounter the spiritual battles of our life. So his baptism offered us hope. His temptation offers us help as we go through the spiritual battles of life. And then we see that Jesus's message offers us healing and sticking with the H theme. Verse number 14, now after John was arrested, it says, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. Repent and believe the gospel. In other words, this word repent means to change directions. We talked about this a little bit last week. That was John's message. Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Well, now Jesus is here. The kingdom of God is here. He says, repent and believe the gospel. What is the gospel? The good news of Jesus. The fact that he was born. The fact that he lived, that he died on a cross. That he was buried and that he rose again. That is the gospel. The good news of Jesus. His death, his burial, his resurrection. That is the gospel. And if you believe and you internalize that message, it's going to bring a healing to your life that you never even began to imagine. Because at the end of the day, our biggest problem is the cancer of sin that infests every single one of us. We're all born with that sin that continues to wreak havoc on our lives 
all throughout our lives. And the only way that we can experience healing is through the power of Jesus and the forgiveness that he offers on the cross. And that's why his message was simply this. Repent, turn from your sin, and believe in the good news of Jesus. His death, his burial, his resurrection. And that will bring the healing you need in your life and offer you more hope than you ever thought you needed. And we're going to get into more about Jesus and his ministry, but I thought this was a good place for us to stop because his message really is so simple. Beyond all the physical healings that Jesus is going to do and all the physical miracles that Jesus is going to do that we're going to see here in Mark, his bigger concern was not the physical, it was the spiritual that he wanted to do in these people's life. Why did he physically bring healing? Because he wanted them to see spiritually their need for healing. And in our lives, sometimes we focus on so many things without recognizing that our greatest need is the spiritual healing we need from our sin. And so Jesus' message is simple. Repent and believe the gospel. Turn from your sin and believe in what Jesus Christ has done for you on the cross. And did you know if you were the only person on planet Earth, Jesus still would have went to those kind of great lengths for you because he loves you that much? Why experience all this temptation? Why leave the glories of heaven where the angels are worshiping him to come to a sin-infested earth, to be born in a stable, to die on a cross? Why do all that? Because he loves you. And he wanted to bridge the gap that sin caused between you and God. And so by him coming, he created a bridge so that the brokenness that sin caused between God and us could be restored, could be renewed, and so now we can be in relationship with God because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross. And that is the message that he's preaching. Repent. Turn from all the other things you're relying on and simply turn to Jesus and believe the good news of the gospel. Amen? And so maybe you're here today, or maybe you're watching online, and as we've been talking about the temptation, all these things, we all know that that's a real part of life is the temptations we face. But we need to understand that as we face temptation, maybe your greatest need is that you simply need to understand your need for Jesus. You need to understand that Jesus came and he died for your sins because the disease of sin is infesting your soul. It's causing division between you and God. And the only way to bring healing is Jesus. And so maybe you're here today and you say, you know what, there's never been a time in, life, in my life when I've repented and I've changed directions and I've simply trusted and asked Jesus to be the Lord of my life. Can I tell you, there's no greater decision that you could ever make than that one decision. And I promise you, the ramifications of that one decision will do things in your life that you've never even begun to think or imagine. And so today, whatever it is that may be holding you back, whatever it is that's keeping you from repenting and believing the gospel, can I encourage you, can I urge you? Set those things aside and simply come to Jesus. Maybe you're here today and you find, you know what, I'm faced temptation, but I don't always attack it in the right way, right? I try to handle it in all these other ways, and I need to get back to attacking it in the right way. I don't know how this lands in the runway of your life, but I do know this. When we come to Jesus, we find hope, we find help, we find healing, and that's what he longs for each of us today. But he's not going to force it upon you. It's something you must willingly embrace yourself. So he offers it to you, but you must willing to say, all right, Jesus, I accept the hope you give. I accept the help you want to give me in my temptation. I, expect, I, I accept the healing you want to bring to my life. And so I surrender my life to you. Here I am, Jesus. I'm yours. So, Father, thank you for the truth of this passage. Lord, thank you for what this teaches us 
about temptation, what this teaches us about life, what this teaches about the battles that we face on a daily basis. But Lord, thank you that the main thing it teaches is that we have a Savior who has already fought the battle for us and who has emerged victorious. And because of that, we can lean on him. And so, God, I pray for each and every person under the sound of my voice this morning, whether it be those online or whether it be those here in this room today, Lord, I pray that however this message is landing in the runway of their heart, that you would just do a work that only you can do. Lord, I cannot save anyone. But, Lord, I pray that if your Holy Spirit is knocking at the door of their heart, that they would choose today to surrender their life to you. That today they would repent and believe the gospel. And so, Lord, I just pray that in the quietness of this moment, as we sing this final song of response, that you will help each of us to respond in the way that you're asking us to respond. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.